This episode of Talk Your Book is proudly brought to you by Honan, providing a complete range of insurance, risk, and financial solutions. Bundy's called me up, told me to take a look, but stay stubborn as bulls and talk their own book. Get the money, get the money, get, get the money. Well, Emmanuel Dat, thanks very much for making your uh, your talkie book debut. Really looking forward to this conversation. I thought a good place to start would be if you walked us through Dat Capital, uh, what your year's been like and, and how you guys structure up your fund. Yeah, sure. No worries, Chris. Thanks for having us. So, um, yeah, our year has actually been uh, very positive, pleasingly, aside from, you know, the obvious market volatility in March that I think everyone got sort of sideswiped with, but um, we've recovered very well from that. Uh, over the past 12 months, we've achieved uh, a return within the fund of over 35%. So we've outperformed the ASX 200 by uh, a sort of circa about 45%. And uh, yeah, very, very pleased uh, with the way the fund is performing at the moment. It's a huge year. And, uh, and you're not just straight equities, you do some commercial debt and, and some other things as well. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So we invest in a, in a multi-asset uh, method or, or strategy. And uh, so we have exposures to sort of unlisted fixed interest and commercial real estate debt, which is unlisted as well. And what stock do you want to walk us through today? So today I'd like to walk you through uh, a new, relatively new ASX listed company called Deterra Royalties. And um, I'll start by explaining a little bit ar- around the royalty business itself. So um, overseas, the royalty uh, businesses are very well known. You've got industry leaders like Franco Nevada and Wheaton Precious Metals being clear institutional grade exposures. Uh, Deterra is the first uh, listed royalty company on the ASX of any sort of scale. I'll walk through a little bit about royalties because I'm sure not too many people are familiar with the asset class itself. So a royalty is generally brought into existence as a form of financing uh, to develop a mine. And what that does, it, it entitles the holder to a share of the mine's value of production effectively. So, you know, in a hypothetical scenario, a royalty company might advance $10 million, let's say, to a mining company with an existing deposit in exchange for a 1% petrol royalty interest. So going forward, then the royalty company or holder will be entitled to 1% of the value of the mine's production value, as well as benefiting from any expiration upside further, further on down the line. And so, you know, effectively the first dollar invested is the last dollar invested, which is a very attractive proposition, as you can imagine. And maybe talk us through the different types of royalties there are and uh, the benefits of a gross overriding royalty that uh, the Deterra royalties have. Yeah, absolutely. So these sort of uh, agreements are generally pretty bespoke. Uh, There are lots of different uh, types of royalties. The the highest quality is... uh, the gross overriding royalty, which is effectively um, a, a share of uh, the commodity price, um, yeah, at the top line in terms of revenue, yeah, less any uh, transportation costs. And then um, as you go further down, yeah, there are various other uh, styles of royalty, but they generally incorporate incorporate some form of uh, operational risk. Uh, so the, so the, they're inferior, basically. And so the risk doesn't really lie around profitability unless profitability would have become deeply negative and the production effectively goes out of business. That's that's really where the risk profile sits. Yeah, absolutely. So you can almost think of it as um, you know, the value of a royalty is directly linked uh, to the ability of the mining property to produce minerals yeah. commercially. And uh, so accordingly, you know, the risk factors are the particular commodity being produced uh, purely because of you know uh, the, the spot price itself, the relative uh, uh, cost position in terms of the industry itself or, or the cost quartile, uh, as it's often known in the industry. And another couple of important aspects are the location of the asset itself. You know, um, there's a big difference between West Africa and Western Australia, yeah. <laughs> for instance, and uh, also the, the life of the the asset, the mining asset itself, um, you know, the longer uh, the mine life, the higher value, theoretically speaking. And so I know future numbers are going to depend a lot 
are in the iron ore price for Deterra's uh, main royalty. But talk us through, say, just from a, a helicopter view, that the numbers now around market cap, debt, uh, revenue, and, and profitability for Deterra. Yeah, sure. So at, at present, Deterra's capped around uh, 2.2 billion Aussie dollars. They're expecting their EBITDA, yeah, I, I, in terms of looking forward. Uh, so Deterra's uh, royalty interest is held over BHP's, or a portion of BHP's Pilbara iron ore operations, which are, as we all know, some of the largest globally. Uh, and so effectively, uh, Deterra hold um, a royalty known as the MAC royalty, which is a gross overriding royalty of 1.23% of uh, revenues. And it also receives uh, one-off increases in capacity uh, payments uh, for, in terms of annual production capacity. So um, BHP uh, increasing capacity within this royalty area to 139 uh, million tonnes of production capacity up from about 55 million tonnes odd. So, you know, increasing by a factor of almost two and a half times um, going forward into 2023. So, um, you know, um, should we yeah, reach 2023 with no sort of hiccups on the production side, we're expecting, um, you yeah, know, at current spot prices uh, for iron ore and FX, uh, for Deterra to be sort of um, yeah, receiving, or, or um, I should say earning uh, 350-odd million uh, in EBITDA, you yeah, just solely off this particular royalty itself. So, um, at the moment, it's sort of, you know, around 100 million or slightly over, I, I would imagine, at today's spot price. But um, one really big attraction is, uh, you know, all this organic growth that uh, effectively, uh, you know, there's no expenditure required from the terror side. So, um, yeah, the first dollar in is the first, <laughs> is the last dollar out, as, as I mentioned before, which is very attractive. That's the thing that stands out, isn't it? When you, you look at the numbers, it's the, the scalability of, of the business model that Deterra's OPEX doesn't go up one cent as that royalty yeah. potentially increases from 100 million today to potentially, you know, north of 300 if, if all things remain equal. Uh, yeah. There's not many businesses. It's almost got elements of a tech business, you know, where um, yeah. the incremental cost is, is basically zero. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, um, we're expecting margins going forward to be, um, you know, well over eighty percent, perhaps uh, even nine, over ninety percent, uh, depending on what the company um, do in terms of cost structure. But um, you know, I think that um, its exposure is um, unparalleled uh, in the listed market. We think that this royalty interest is um, probably the highest quality uh, available in any uh, listed uh, royalty company vehicle globally. And um, we, we think it's just a fantastic asset. But maybe talk, uh, maybe dig a bit deeper into that, into, um, you know, in fact, counterparty risk, jurisdiction, um, lowest quartile of, of production. Maybe talk through those three factors as to why it's such an investment grade royalty compared to some other royalties you might find overseas. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the project is being operated by BHP. So they're one of the best uh, miners and uh, one of the strongest uh, financial counterparties you could ask for. Uh, also, in terms of the, the location of the asset, you're situated in you know, what we consider to be unequivocally uh, the world's best mining jurisdiction in Western Australia. And uh, also these uh, mining assets are within the lowest uh, price of, you know, in terms of the production price quartile. So it'll produce you know, rain, hail, or sunshine effectively. Um, also, one important point that I think uh, is important to raise is that um, uh, given the geopolitical uh, you know, issues we're, ex we're seeing out in the world today, uh, yeah, especially given the relationship between China and Australia, iron ore has not been affected throughout that, despite other commodities like coal and uh, you know, consumer goods, for example, being affected. Uh, so that tells you that iron ore is truly an irreplaceable uh, commodity for um, Chinese buyers and um, so it's politically insulated which is uh, a very uh, attractive attribute to to have in these uncertain times. Um, one other thing I should probably mention is the length of mine is currently about 30 years 
Uh, however, um, we, we think there's clear potential for that to expand uh, well past 50 years of my life. So you have uh, what is a very long life, uh, defensive, almost um, yeah, annuity style asset here uh, for the taking. And what's the dividend ratio or the payout ratio policy of, of Deterra? Yeah, so Deterra, they committed to paying out 100% of net profit after tax. And uh, I would imagine that would probably be via, you know, a half year uh, dividend or half yearly dividend. Uh, Deterra themselves, they really uh, uh, receive the royalty payment from, uh, itself on a quarterly basis. So you never know, it might be even a quarterly thing. It's still um, very fresh to the listed market. So uh, yeah, that's still to be seen. You know, it's a, it's a nice, simple business to get your head around currently. There, there's one sort of um, royalty to really dig into it and understand. As they potentially look to grow by acquisition, one of the challenges they may face is it's not that great time to be uh, providing bidding for royalties from mining companies at the minute because mining companies can raise equity at, at reasonable valuations. So they may not be as incentivized as they are when their equity prices are depressed to commit to a new royalty arrangement. How do you feel about that? that? Do you think there's certain sectors within the commodity index that, that still may be um, dealing with challenging equity prices that will look to commit to these relationships? Or how are you viewing that potential future risk for doTERRA? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a very valid concern. Um, you know, I think that royalties uh, are still a very attractive asset class to invest in, you know, especially given how low uh, cash rates are at the moment. Um, uh, and, you know, in terms of new product, uh, new project generation, um, I, I suppose a lot of it comes down to the individual mining company itself. Um, if you have, if, for example, if you, um, uh, if, if there's a mining company or mining developer, I should say, where the management team have a large uh, interest in the equity itself, um, there are clear incentives for them not to you know, go out and raise massive licks of capital and dilute their own interest uh, when uh, you know, royalty might be a more viable solution uh, yeah, and, and more attractive in the long term. And I so, guess it doesn't leave you as exposed as debt. I mean, if you're a founder and you've got 40% of the equity and you don't want to be diluted, you may be nervous about committing to a lot of debt too because you're potentially exposed should, should something awry come up. So yeah. is there the sorts of companies that Deterra will be potentially looking to target? Yeah, absolutely. And one recent deal I can think of uh, um, yeah, off the top of my head is uh, Soul Gold, who have a large or made a large um, gold copper discovery in Ecuador. Um, you know, they have new crest, they've got BHP on the register, but the management team who own quite um, a large portion of the stock decide to sell a royalty to Franco Nevada, uh, who are one of the big company, uh, royalty businesses I, I mentioned to, uh, a bit early on in the piece. So I think that sort of shows that uh, there still will be appetite, you know, in this with this form of financing going forward. So, uh, but ultimately, you know, it's down to the, the terror's management team to put their best foot forward uh, when pursuing these deals. Um, yeah, but and even you, if they don't pursue any new deals or or don't secure any new deals, I think the value of the company itself is underpinned quite strongly uh, just due to holding this uh, very high quality asset on the books. Absolutely. Uh, now, you mentioned Franco Nevada there, which is a company that Kirill Sokolov describes as the world's best business, I believe. And Kirill uh, yeah. is, is part of mandated reading uh, for me each week. Maybe talk yeah. us through why they could potentially have an interest in Deterra down the track. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Franco Nevada are uh, probably the world's largest uh, royalty company. And uh, they hold, um, it must be about, you know, 70 or 80 producing royalties and uh, probably far more, you know, probably hundreds of other <laughs> royalties that they probably managed to accumulate that aren't re yeah, reported because they're not material. Um, you know, so in terms of Franco Nevada's portfolio itself, uh, you know, they, they hold um, royalty interests over many large projects. But, uh, you know, ultimately, as you, as you said previously, it all comes down to scale. So um, we've examined their portfolio, their royalty portfolio itself. And uh, if they were to acquire, you know, hypothetically, uh, the Mac royalty or doTERRA as a whole, we could expect their revenue 
purely off this single royalty to increase by over 20%, which mm. is enormous considering this is the largest royalty company globally we're talking about. And, um, you know, if the market attributes the same multiple, uh, you know, for any potential acquisition, we'd expect a likely value uplift of, um, you know, around $8 billion um, Aussie should their multiple remain stable. So I think that it's almost a no brainer for them to acquire. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, in time, we don't know whether that might be sooner or later, but I, I think it would be an absolute no brainer for, you know, if I was in, in their shoes um, to acquire this fantastic asset. Um, you know, the royalty business has become increasingly more competitive. Uh, you know, one of the issues, as you say, is the easy availability of equity funding and, and uh, risk capital, I guess you could call it. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm sort of expecting to see a bit of an uptick in M&A uh, within this particular niche of, um, of companies uh, worldwide. So, um, yeah. And when you think about valuation of a, a company like Deterra, do you think about it, obviously the iron ore price is clearly relevant, but yeah. then also bond yields must be really relevant too when you're comparing one cash flow over a really extended mine life versus another cash flow, e.g. bond yields. Um, it, does it feel to you there's some insurance there that if the iron ore price would have dropped significantly, but at the same time bond yields would have to go even lower or potentially even negative, that from yeah. a valuation perspective, that would insulate some of the risk for a, a company like this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, if, um, you know, the cash rate uh, went negative, it, it is, you know, negative in term in real terms, mm. I, I'd um, probably say. But uh, if it went negative in nominal terms, then you could just imagine that valuations for these sort of annuity type assets would just it probably explode. And would that become more important than the iron ore price even, do you think, in terms of a valuation perspective? Uh, I think that both would probably be of similar importance. Uh, you know, one other, you know, alternative scenario that we have thought about is perhaps BHP uh, who run, you know, these properties itself and who are the ones ultimately paying out um, their share of revenue to Deterra might decide to take them over and just, uh, you know, internalise the royalty effectively. And they could access debt so cheaply by HP at the minute as well. You could see. Yeah, that. yeah, absolutely. I think their, their debt's trading at, you know, 2 or 3% yield. So, you know, incredibly low cost of borrowing. And, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, to acquire into terror would just be, you know, effectively you know, a tiny, tiny little acquisition to someone like the HP. Well, that, that just about rounds it up. Um, I love talking about it. It's not a company I'd, it was on my radar at all. Um, I loved reading about it when you, you did a post on it and, and then wrapped you were able to come on and uh, dig a little deeper on it. So thanks very much, Manuel. Yeah, no worries, Chris. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Mark. This episode of Talk Your Book was proudly brought to you by Honan, who go beyond a transactional insurance broker to deliver better outcomes for their clients. If you're enjoying Talk Your Book, make sure you subscribe to Chris Judd Invest.